Say, this is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. And I can have what it says I can have. My mind is alert and my spirit is receptive to the living Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Before you sit down, greet one person and say, I'm glad you're here today. Amen. Amen. Anyway, today is uh, number three as I talk more about the power of names in the Bible. And specifically, we're talking about the Hebrew part of our Bible. And today I'm going to be talking about the Father's name revealed, how we know the Father, why we should be interested in speaking about the Father concerning the Word of God. There is a pattern and a timeline of, re of the redemption of man that is coming full circle. And we're right at the end of that age where you're, we're going to be seeing that coming full circle. We know that we're at the end of a 6,000 uh, year timeline of man. We're coming into that end time right now. This is the end of the end of the age. And we're going to be coming in eventually into the seven year tribulation and then into the 1,000 millennial year reign of Christ in the earth. Then the final white throne judgment and then the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So that's the pattern. And we're right at the end of the age where everything is coming full circle. Adam and Eve started out in the garden and they started out with everything being pure, everything growing good. There was, there was no uh, reason for, there was no death. There was no reason for death. There was nothing, there were no weeds to kill. There was, uh, everything was growing well, doing well. Man was doing well. Man was operating at, at, his, at his pinnacle of his abilities. And then sin entered into the world. And then we saw a general uh, decline, not only of the age of man, but just the way man thought. And we saw that general decline. And then we came into the time where grace appeared. Jesus came and went to the cross. And we now we're in this what's called this 2,000 year dispensation of grace where we're operating and things are starting to come back up again. And we're coming into that end of the end of the age where there's a revelation that also comes with this period of grace. And the revelation has been building. And I'm going to be explaining that as I have been explaining for probably now about six or seven years on how we need to understand certain things from the Hebrew Bible. And we're going to see that this period of redemption and our intellectual ascent to this redemption is getting greater. Anyway, there's an ebb and flow of the history of what I'll call spirituality in the earth, true spirituality. And we're going to be looking at that here today. Again, my message is entitled, The Father's Name Revealed. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 6 this morning. In verse 8, so do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. All right? So he's talking about asking thing, for things repetitively in the same prayer, not repetitively throughout the course of the week. Then he goes on in verse 9, he says this, pray then in this way. Why don't we just uh, read it together? If you have an NASB, I'll read it from the NASB. Why don't we just read it out loud together? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Then he goes on to talk some more about parts of that prayer. In the beginning of this prayer, he said, pray then in this way. So not only do we have a prayer, and I have a, wrote a book on 30 days of praying the Our Father, not only do we have a prayer to pray, but we have an outline of prayer. Now, my wife and I, we say the Our Father probably most every day. We, maybe we forget occasionally. But then we'll go back and pray aspects of the Our Father specifically things that are pertaining to our life. All right, so pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father is used in the Old Testament many times, and it's not a new thing. So when Jesus is talking about the Father, he's talking about praying to the Father, and it's something that is not being taught brand new. A lot of people say, well, the Our Father's brand new. No, it's not. It's not brand new. It's all all through the Old Testament scripture. In fact, I want to take you someplace right now. Hold your place in Matthew 6. We're going to come back to that. And go with me over to Isaiah 63, starting in verse 15. Look down from heaven and see your holy 
and glorious habitation. Where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? The stirrings of your heart and your compassion are restrained towards me. Look at verse 16. For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not recognize you, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer from of old is your name. Now, for those of you who know my teaching, and I'm going to be getting into this teaching deep today, we're going to be starting basically from the beginning on this particular teaching. It says here in verse 16, you are our father, though Abraham does not know us. Who could that be speaking of? If Abraham was to know somebody, he would know his lineage, or he would be, Abraham being the father of the Jews, you could say. So Abraham would know, bloodline-wise, who was his offspring. But we're told in Galatians that if we are of Christ, or of the Messiah, Jesus, then we are Abraham's heirs, or Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So not only now are bloodline Jews heirs of salvation through Abraham, if they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, but also now the Gentiles are as well. Understand that this is a prophecy in Isaiah given roughly about 600, 650 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And again, verse 16, you are our father, though Abraham does not know us. And Israel does not recognize us. What is one of the things that we know about modern Israel today? Modern Israel today does not accept modern Christianity. Uh, you can go to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, you're going to see a lot of different sects of Judaism all being practiced in the same place together. The Wailing Wall is there, and all the different sects will be in their different sets of clothing. And then you can leave Jerusalem, drive some 70 miles or so over to Tel Aviv, and walk into a different environment completely. It's like going, I don't know, it's like going from uh, the Sistine Chapel all the way to uh, some place that's not the Sistine Chapel. It is just, uh, Tel Aviv is a wild, young city. Tel Aviv is a re relatively new city. It was uh, birthed right around 1905 and, and given its a proper name in 1906. And it's mostly a young people city. There's no religion virtually at all being practiced in Tel Aviv. You walk into a different country. And so it's, it's kind of like walking onto a uh, college campus where there is no God. And so in one hand, on Jerusalem, they're all practicing Judaism, but they do not acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. And on the other hand, over in Tel Aviv, there's virtually no religion being practiced, you know, comparably. And certainly, even though there's Christian churches there and also uh, Jewish churches there, you know, synagogues there, uh, it's, it's, it's night and day, just a short distance apart in the same country. Now, with that in mind, again, verse 16, you are our father, though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not recognize us. You, O oh Lord, are our father, and we know that O and that L-O-R-D there, you see it's all in caps in most of your Bibles. That O is not there in the original Hebrew, and the L-O-R-D is not there either. Now, you can go back to Matthew, but if you want to just kind of hold your place there, for those of you who have Bibles that have, uh, in all of you have something in the beginning of your Bible, I'm going to show you something. In your Bible is a table of contents, and mine's relatively short, and, I, and mine right here, you might, you're not going to be able to read it, of course, from that distance, but I have the forward, I have the preface to the New American Standard Bible, and then I have what's called the Principles of Translation, and that is on page X or page 10, right? So I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to read you something. And this is in... Uh, a lot of your Bible, so you can look in your own Bible. If you don't have an NASB, look in the beginning of your Bible. I want you to read what I'm going to read. Go to the section that talks about the principles of translation or how they translated it. If you're looking in the NASB, you're going to be able to find this in the middle of the page. Here it is right here, so if you have a problem finding it, you're going to be able to look down to the third paragraph, and I'm going to start reading there. You're going to see something in your Bible that may shock you. And it says, the proper name of God in the Old Testament. That's the heading. In the scriptures, the name of God is most significant, understandably so. It is inconceivable to think of spiritual matters without a proper designation of the supreme deity. Capital S on supreme, capital D on deity. Thus, the most common name for the deity is God. 
a translation of the original Elohim. And I've taught that here. And maybe next week we'll show Hebrew uh, on the overhead. One of the titles for God is Lord. Okay, remember how I've told you repeatedly that the, calling God Lord is his title. It's not his name. It may even be his designation, but it's still not his name. All right. So one of the titles for God is Lord, a translation of Adonai, right, which is he, he, Adonai's Hebrew. Yet there is another name which is particularly assigned to God as a special or proper name. That is the four letters YHVH or in here in here is YHWH. But if you notice that that uh, that's been changing to YHVH in a lot of your Bibles and a lot of understanding. The W is no longer being used. Now I have it up here. And again, I wanted to show everyone, particularly for those you have never seen this teaching before, these are the four Hebrew consonants in your Old Testament that appear approximately 7,000 times. And in every single one of those times, it's covered up because of a rule that the Jews began to make roughly right about 30 to 40 AD. And I'll explain that as I'm teaching here again today. So we have a Yud, which is a Hebrew letter. It's a consonant. Then we have a He. You have this letter here with this piece here. Then we have a Vav, and then we have another He. All right, without going into too much, that's transliterated into a Y, H, V, H. And it used to be this letter was translated into a W in English, but now it's trans. And then whenever you see it, you see it all in capital letters. So it's in capital letters as it's being shown here in my principles of translation in the beginning of my Bible. Now it's interesting. I believe that one man can change the nation. I believe that one man who stays firm can change an entire spiritual atmosphere. I believe that as, you remember the story of the little boy who put his finger in the dike and he prevented the dike from blowing up and, and, and destroying the entire village? He, one person can stop an enormous amount of evil. One person can bring an enormous amount of good. When I first started teaching this, Everyone in our congregation, I believe, believed it for the most part. You know, I'm, I, you know if people weren't believing it, then uh, I was teaching it so in depth. I had the Hebrew on the overhead every single week, and we were looking at it specifically. And here, unbeknownst to me, when I first started this study, I only discovered a couple years ago this principles of translation in my Bible. And I had been teaching on this going like, why are they coming this up? You're about to find out here as I continue to read. Okay, is a translation of Adonai. Yet there is another name which is particularly assigned to God as a special or proper name, that is the four letters, uh, yud heh vav -Hey. This name has not been pronounced by the Jews, listen to what he's saying, by the Jews because of reverence for the great sacredness of the divine name. Therefore, it has been consistently translated L-O-R-D in caps. The only exception to this translation of yud heh vav -Hey is when it occurs uh, in immediate proximity to the word Adonai or Lord. And in that case, it's regularly translated God in order to avoid confusion. So uh, in, if you pick up a, a Jewish Bible today or even a complete Jewish Bible, you'll see uh, many times in there, uh, they'll say Adonai rather than saying what's actually going on in the Bible. And so uh, it, that is a, um, something that was started 2000, roughly 2,000 years ago. And I'll talk about how interesting this thing is. But as we see all that convention, which we'll call it convention, all that convention being pushed forward many times when uh, someone was looking to translate the Old Testament into either Latin or Greek or translate the Old Testament from Hebrew into modern English or another language, many times they would go back to the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew, or they would go to uh, some other translation, but not to the original Hebrew. If they went to the original Hebrew, one of the problems that they experienced was they would be, have to be talking to a Jew, generally speaking, a rabbi, not a Messianic Jew. Someone that was keeping the Hebrew language alive, maybe in 400 A.D., 500 A.D., 1000 A.D. Not many Jews that were Messianic, 
were keeping the Hebrew language alive. There's a reason for that. They were being assimilated into the rest of the culture of the world. Uh, if they were staying Messianic and kept their, their Hebrew roots, that would have been a very difficult thing to do over subsequent generations. And so if you wanted to have a proper translation of the original Hebrew, you would go to a Jew who knew Hebrew, who was preserving it, generationally speaking, and you would go there and they would have that convention already in their mind that they did not say the name of God. And they would tell the person who wanted the translation into their mother tongue why the name of God wasn't said. So they would pass that convention on in the translation of the Old Testament, whether it be German or English or French or some other translation, say right around 1200 AD, 1400 AD. And so this convention of restricting or covering up the name of God was there. And it was preventable. And as I said at the beginning of this message, we're coming now full circle where when I started teaching on this, I didn't know of anyone else teaching on it. I certainly didn't know of anyone in our, what I'll call faith group, uh, large you know, extended faith group or Pentecostal group that we sort of are associated with. There are Messianic churches out there, but they didn't seem to actually mesh with the, uh, with the groups that I was associated with. And so they were teaching their thing. And even in their churches, if you look in a complete Jewish Bible, when it comes up to yud Hey vav Hey, the convention for 2,000 years has been to say Adonai. Adonai is not what this says. This says Yahweh. I'll keep reading in my Bible here in a moment. But they would say Adonai, which means Lord. It's still not his name. When I was taking all my Hebrew classes, and some of my Hebrew classes were run by Christians, but the majority of them were run by Jews in Israel. Some of them were American Jews that had moved to Israel permanently. And they were, they were, some of them were rabbis. And when we got to that name, even though it said yud Hey vav Hey, the convention in the class was to say Adonai. So everyone's trying to be polite and say Adonai, and I said it a bunch of times, and finally I got tired of that, and I said, listen, I just, it's really grinding against my spirit to say Adonai, can I say the name and break convention? And they didn't like that when I did that. And the other students didn't like that because I was being the oddball, I was being the odd man out in these classes. Well, we just need to go along to get along and learn the Hebrew, we don't want to offend anybody. And yet, I'm going to show you here today, by not saying God's name is offensive to him. And I'll teach you that here today. And so I'd rather offend man and not offend God. I think that would be okay. So uh, again, I'm reading in the middle of this paragraph in my Bible, this name has not been pronounced because the Jews, by the Jews, because of reverence for the great sacredness of the divine name. Therefore, it has been consistently translated Lord. The only exception to this translation of yud heh vav is when it occurs in immediate proximity to the word Lord, that is Adonai. In that case, it is regularly translated G-O-D in order to avoid confusion. It is, it is known that for many years, yud heh vav -Heh has been transliterated as Yahweh. However, no complete certainty attaches to this pronunciation. Okay? Transliteration, just so I can get this term out of the way for those of you, again, who haven't heard this teaching. Transliteration is when you're saying something in one language and it doesn't really have a meaning, but you want it to have the sound in the next language. All right? So if you're saying something in Chinese, and you want that sound of that word to remain the same, what you do is you transliterate it into English. So no matter if you're Chinese or if you're American or you're speaking English, you can, that, that word or that name sounds identical. All right? So if in Chinese it means life giver, I don't say translate it into life giver in English. I translate it sounding like it sounds in Chinese. And then whatever that sounds like in English is how we, so we don't translate the word. We transliterate the word to make it sound like the original word. So what's happening here in this last uh, separate paragraph, it's just a one line paragraph, it says it's known for many years that Yudhe Vavhe has been transliterated as Yahweh. In other words, a transliteration is to keep the sound, not the meaning. That's important. So sometimes that works. 
In the Bible, many times it doesn't work. But when it comes to God's particular name, to have it transliterated, in other words, have it sound like it originally sounded when it was being said by God, is important to us today. And you'll see that again here in this teaching. Anyway, so if you ever wonder where some of this came from, don't take as long as it took me to find that it's probably already in your Bible. And it's, there's already in part being explained there. Not in full, but in part. And the reason why it's not being explained in full is because they don't understand why there's this convention to not utter God's holy name. And as you go through this study here today, you're going to have all this revealed to you, which is so exciting. All right? So now, let's go back to Matthew and the Our Father. And again, today's message is entitled, The Father's Name Revealed. And look at this in verse 9, Matthew 6, verse 9. Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. All right, so if we're going to say his name or hallow his name, we're going to have to know what that name is, number one. Number two, we have to know what hallowed means. Hallowed, there, I have a book on my shelf that takes Greek words and translates them back into the Hebrew. And hallowed, trans, from the Greek, translated back into the Hebrew means kadosh, which means holy or sanctified. Now watch this now. All right? So it means hallowed to being sanctified means set apart. So we set his name apart. We don't set his title apart or his designation apart, but we set his name apart. All right? And I'm not going to ignore the rest of, that, rest of that prayer because the first part is important to us. If we're going to be praying to the Father, Jesus 2,000 years ago taught us to pray to the Father. How many people here today think that Jesus probably knew the Father's name? And the answer is, Everyone, not just Jesus, but everyone knew the Father's name back in the days of Jesus. The convention that came in happened after he went to the cross and took a period of roughly about 40 years. So about from 30 A.D., that's when he went to the cross at 30 A.D., to the next 40 years up until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., that convention to conceal God's holy name began to occur and I'll give you some examples of that here today. All right? So now let's go over to Exodus chapter 3, Exodus 3. And in Exodus 3, we see the burning bush episode of, of Moses and God appearing to Moses, God the Father appearing to Moses. And he talks over in verse 3, so Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. So Moses sees this bush and he sees this illumination in it and it's kind of like putting LEDs in your Christmas tree. This is the way I imagine it modern day today. Here, God's got certainly brighter than just LEDs and, and Christmas lights. But here he's illuminating that by his own power. But it's not burning up the material of that bush. So it's marvelous to look at. And verse 5, do not come near here or remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And verse 6, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. All right. So he's being, Moses is being told which God he is. Now, uh, at the end of the completion of the time of the Israelites uh, going down to Egypt, then eventually being enslaved in Egypt was a total of about 400 years. All right, so through this time, and although Abraham knew God's name, and we can see that in future studies, it had been forgotten. And they, you could say that the Jews had basically crossed over, lost their Jewish roots. And even though they had a little bit going on for them and practicing a little bit, not much was being practiced. And they had adopted the, the practices of the Egyptians and having many gods. In fact, the Egyptians had some 300 gods. One of their gods, one of their, one of their top gods was a sheep god. And so when they talked about offering up sheep as a sacrifice to God, that was abhorrent to Egyptians. And so there was many gods in Egypt. And so God begins to speak to him. And then let's jump down to verse 13. 
Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say, What is his name? What shall I say to them? The reason why uh, he has to give them a name is everyone has a name for all these different gods in Egypt. You call them different names. And so these are not true gods, small g gods, but the Egyptians were worshiping these gods. And they, did, they were practicing abominable practices within their own homes in worship of these false deities. So Moses logically says, now if you're the God of the fathers of the Israelites, and you're telling me that, I believe you, uh, what shall I say to them that your name is? Now a word on biblical giving. Then we'll return to the message. Turn with me this morning in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs 11, verse 23. The desire of the righteous is only good. The expectation of the wicked is wrath. You know, uh, wicked people don't, you know, even if they think they're going to be doing good for a while, they don't really think it's going to be long term. And they'll even tell you that, you know, they'll make some comment about going to hell when they die as if that's some sort of a flattering term to say. And so the righteous should expect good. And we have an expectation of good coming into our life. All kinds of good. In verse 24, there is one who scatters and increases all the more. And there is one withholds what is justly due, and it results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. We have a comparison scripture, of course. Jesus said, uh, give and it shall be given back to you in the book of Luke. Give and it shall be given back to you. Pressed down, running over, shall men heap into your bosom. So when Jesus was giving us that mini sermon, he was actually quoting in part Old Testament scripture, particularly right here. The generous man will be prosperous and he who waters will himself be watered. So as we give, God gives back. One of the greatest things that I've discovered about giving to the household of God is giving to the household of God generously means you will not fall in love with money. Money is not the root of all evil. How many people know that? The love of money is the cause of all evil. So we want to make sure that uh, we don't have a love of money. And, and one of the ways to make sure that we don't have a love of money, right? Love of money produces all sorts of evil. We do all kinds of things, evil things, in order to get it. Uh, many times people will say, will say, well, the, the ends justify the means. In other words, if I do good with my money. I remember a man I heard on, on radio back some 25 years ago robbed a bank. And he gave some of the proceeds of his robbery to his minister. And he said, you know, listen, I, I'm given to the household of God. This makes it good. The means, the ends do not justify the means. Many times we go and we're looking to go for that brass ring and uh, we're doing all kinds of things that are wrong against our fellow man in order to do that. But if we have the right heart towards money, we'll be honest in our dealings throughout the week. Can I hear an amen? amen. And if we're honest uh, during, uh, with our dealings throughout the week, uh, we can also learn to be generous. Generosity takes away, particularly good generosity, takes away a love of money. So love of money is the root of all evil. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. As you water uh, you know, this church with your giving, uh, trust me, God will give back to you. He'll make you more generous. And the amazing thing is he'll rebuke the devourer for you and for your sake. Uh, how does God rebuke the devourer? Number one, he causes you to live longer. Number two, he causes you not to be in the hospital. Number three, you won't be on medications as much as we've had so many people get off of medications in this church. They come to me and I didn't even know they were on six medications. And they're giving in this church for two years. All of a sudden they come up to me and go, you know, we're not on medications anymore in our house. Isn't that something? Praise God. Giving produces good, all kinds of good. And it breaks all kinds of bondage off of your life. Ushers, if you would, come on forward this morning. We're going to pray over our offering here today. Praise God. Let's pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name once again over all of our gifts. And I pray, Father God, over every gift and every giver, those that supply online, those that are watching our television broadcast. 
Father, we thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. And Father, I ask that you would give back bountifully, Father God, as, as your word says, that we can depend on that, that those that give bountifully will receive bountifully. And Father God, we thank you for that now. We thank you for that miracle to appear in their lives. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen. You may give three easy ways by going to mountainfaith.org, calling 608-356-1804, extension 101, or by writing David Gonzalez Ministries, P.O. Box 847, Lake Delton, Wisconsin, 53940. Give your best today. So Moses logically says, now if you're the God of the fathers of the Israelites, and you're telling me that, I believe you, uh, what shall I say to them? That your name is verse 14 in your English here it's going to say God said to Moses I am who I am and he said thus you shall say to the sons of Israel I am sent me to you now I'm going to read this here in the Hebrew I wrote it down in my notes uh, for you in Hebrew it says a yeah a share a yeah which means I exist that I exist I exist that I exist. So if I say to someone, I am, we've lost that a little bit in translation. I would rather see something more to the effect of I exist that I exist or I be that I be. When God spoke, the same words are being used in Genesis chapter one. When God spoke, for example, light into, into, into being, he said, light be. And just two Hebrew words, light exist. And so we see that same word being used here concerning God. In other words, I exist that I exist. Say that I exist sent me to you or the perfect God. Now, here's the reason why he did that. He wanted to make sure that he separated himself from all the other gods that don't exist, that were, were a, a figment of their imagination, were a figment of their writings, were a figment of their practices, but weren't really true gods at all. And he said, I want you to tell the Israelites that I'm a God who exists compared to all the other gods that you worship that don't really exist. I exist that I exist. I am that I am. I have always been, in fact, in other translations, as you read this through and study it through, it gets really complicated, but you could say, I was, I am, and I will be, also in these same words. And there's a lot of other things that you can uh, bring from this. I exist, if I say that I exist, one of the words that uh, is being used when Adam is formed, God breathed into him the spirit of life. And that word, again there, is that word to be, or yehe, and I exist, or I bring, breathe life into Adam, forming him in the Garden of Eden. So God says, I exist, or I breathe, or I, I am. And there isn't anything greater. There isn't anyone who has a higher designation than that. And not only is he using those words, but he's using the letters from those Hebrew words to come up with this name. So we see in these letters, Yud, He, Vav, and He, we see that in I exist that I exist, those Hebrew letters appear, okay? What's being revealed here, I believe, will eventually become commonplace. And I know that you're gonna see scriptures today that'll show, prophecies that show that this will eventually become commonplace. Everyone will be saying Yahweh. No one will be saying Lord anymore. Now, how did that convention start? I want to take you over to um, Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel 39, verse 7. It says, My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore, and the nations will know that I am, here in English it says, I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Again, the convention there is to cover up his name. My holy name I will, I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, yet in the same verse, his name is being concealed in our English translations. Because you'll see at the very end, I am the Lord, the is not in there, not in the Hebrew, because he's not the Lord. He's not the Lord of our life. I am Yahweh, the Holy One in Israel. So the prophecy that's being given here is eventually we're going to see that everyone 
earthwide, worldwide, is going to be using God's proper name. And again, I know for a fact that will be happening during the millennial reign, but I think that as we come up to the rapture of the church, we're going to see more and more churches. I'm actually quite shocked. I thought I was going to be teaching on this for 10 or 15 years before we even saw someone beginning to cross over and look at the original Hebrew in what I'll call Pentecostal, Holy Ghost, uh, Spirit-filled. It's been out there. But it's been in, in smaller, I think mostly Messianic churches, but some Messianic churches still hold to the old convention, and they still will not say his name. They'll say, well, we can't say his name, it's too holy. In fact, I, I go to uh, many types of uh, uh, what I'll call Jewish-run meetings, and I get many emails, and when they even now, they've got to the place where they won't even say God in a letter. They'll have G hyphen and a D in English, and they'll hyphenate that in order to, so they won't be even saying God, even though God can mean anything. God can mean small g, God could be big g, they give it a big g in their letters and on their, and, and their, you know, on their materials. But this convention has gotten so bad within, uh, within both Judaism and with churches, Christian churches, that don't understand where this convention came from. All right, now, um, since God's meaning, God's name has meaning and not just sound, we learn a lot more about him when we understand the meaning. All right, so now let's go over to Isaiah chapter 64 now and start reading. We're going to start reading in verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are a filthy garment, like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name. Look at that. When we say Lord, and the, the writing in the original Hebrew, in the biblical Hebrew is yud heh vav -Hey, and we refuse to say his name, then we're hiding his name and we're not saying his name. Look at this here in verse 7. There is no one who calls on your name. I want to stop. I want to settle a confusion that a lot of people have. They go, well, yeah, that's the Old Testament. That's just for the Jews. No, it's not. No, it is not. It is for the Gentiles as well because we just read that back in verse 16 of the previous chapter. We read again, you are our father, though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us. I believe that is a prophetic statement talking about the modern church. And in fact, the church for the last 2,000 years. And then we read over in this next chapter, there is no one who calls on your name. And Jesus just told us in Matthew chapter 6, he said, pray then in this way, our father, hallowed be thy name. How can we hallow a name that we don't know we don't know how to pronounce, or we've been given convention we're not allowed to say in the Christian church. All right, so there is no one who calls on your name, who arouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. In fact, uh, without going to the specific scriptures, whenever Israel, previous to Jesus coming on the scene, began to forget God's perfect and holy name, that's when the enemy began to mount up against them. And then they would, they would get a, a, a prophecy from a prophet. And he would go, we need to come back and start saying his name again. And when they started to say in his name again, depending on what, what generation that was, they would see Israel increasing all over again and begin to have a resurgence of worship of his name. Now, let me have you uh, go to Psalm 74, Psalm 74. Psalm 74, verse 18. Remember this, and now I'm saying, instead of saying, O Lord, I'm going to say what is actually there in the Hebrew. Remember this, Yahweh, that the enemy has reviled and a foolish people has spurned your name. To spurn means to reject or means to not uh, uh, consider or means to not turn to. So if you spurn someone, you turn away from them. If you spurn God's name, you turn away from his name. Remember this, Yahweh, that the enemy has reviled, basically your name, and a foolish people, a foolish people has spurned your name. Now, let me tell you the history of how this convention began to come into place. Back in um, roughly right around the time that Jesus went to the cross, Israel was under Roman rule, 
and even the high priests that were selected during Jesus' ministry. Jesus was in ministry for roughly three and a half years. During his three and a half year ministry, there was four high priests assigned over Israel, over Jerusalem, over the people, over Jews, that were not chosen the normal way, the biblical way, or you call it, call it the Mosaic way, four of them that were chosen by Rome and not by the Jews themselves. And Caiaphas was one of them. We know his name because it's a more popular name. But all four of the high priests were chosen not by Jews and not by, by the Mosaic pattern, but by Rome deciding to choose these political appointees that were Jewish, but they were political appointees. In that same period of time, not only was Rome taking over or robbing Judaism of its roots, but during that period of time, uh, Roman authorities knew that if there was going to be an uprising of the Jews, it would be done in a religious setting. It would start, you could say, in the synagogues or at a religious grassroots movement. And it wouldn't be a military movement until it had gained some power. So it would start as a grassroots spiritual religious movement. And as it grew in power, it would then become more active, you could say more violent. Uh, for those of you who know the Masada story, that is a wonderful example of a religious uh, ground, grassroots movement growing and growing and growing more violent until it became a military force. And so the Romans decided somewhere between 30 AD and 70 AD when Rome was, Rome was excuse me, when uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, in that period of time, Rome was making rules that you couldn't mention his name under certain category, uh, categories. So first, the first ban that was put on the name was saying the name publicly. Then the second, name, second time that there was a ban that you couldn't say the name in the synagogue publicly during an open prayer. Then the third ban is you couldn't even whisper it under your lips. In 135, 136 AD, to give you an example, the ban was so strong within the Jewish community, the Jews already were writing about the ban. So if I take you from 70 AD up to 135 AD, I've just now covered 65 years. A lot of information can get lost as to why there's a ban in 65 years. And a lot of people can justify why they're doing what they're doing because within their ranks, you're gonna have Jews who are political appointees by Rome, who are willing to placate Rome and put rules into place, which the Jews were already used to following. So one more rule was just going to be, uh, it was going to look like it fit in. It looked like it belonged there. So they began to say, well, in order for us to follow this rule, I had to have to convince everyone, all the Jewish people under me or that I'm associating with, let's make it a, let's, let's make this rule a uh, digestible. Let's say that there's a ban on the name that Moses said. So they came up with this initially, and this is in writings even still to this day, that Moses said that there was a ban on God's name and that it could only be whispered to Aaron and his sons and it would be whispered as one father was dying, he would pass on that name to the next generation. Or it could be whispered amongst the high priest, but it couldn't be told to anybody else. But that goes contrary to what we just read in Exodus chapter 3. What we just read there is, what should I tell them is your name? And say, I am sent me to you, or I exist sent me to you. So the name had to be well known. But the writings today are convoluted, and they're backwards saying, well, the ban on the name started with Moses. Well, that's not true because Jesus knew his name. Then the next thing was happening is more writings were coming in. He said, well, his name is so perfect, we can't utter it because we're imperfect people. And so the, another writing came up, which was happening between 30 AD and 70 AD. And, and then it continued after that and got stronger, got put in the more writings after that. Well, that his name is too perfect. It's too pure. Or we don't know how to pronounce the name. And so the ban continues even up to this day. And the ban is so strong, the convention is so strong that some people feel that they're coming against the rules of God by saying his name. 
I know long, I've done, I've studied this for too many years, for too long, for too many hours in the day to know or believe that's true. I know that God wants us to say his name. Now, I'm going to take you to some proofs of this. Uh, let me take you over to John chapter 17, John 17. Where else does Jesus talk about this? It's all over the Gospels. But in John 17, verse 11, and again, you can see that Jesus is speaking. And he said, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. Well, what is his name? What's the Father's name? It's not Lord. It's not Adonai. It's not, as, as some put in some of their writings, in Jewish writings, it's not Hashem, the name. It is yud heh vav -Hey, or Yahweh, as it's commonly pronounced now today. Again, I want to read that to you. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. In other words, not only is it possible that Jesus is using the Father's name while he's praying this prayer to the Father, because that's what's happening here. Look here. Jesus is praying. That's the first thing. So if I'm praying for somebody, according to the rules that Jesus laid down for us, I pray to the Father, John chapter 14, John 16. If I pray to the Father for anything in the name of Jesus, I can expect that thing to come to pass. So Jesus is praying to the Father, and he's asking that we are protected in his name. So two things are, are being accomplished. Number one, we're being protected under the umbrella, you could say, of yud heh vav -Hey of Yahweh, number one. Number two, we're being protected to keep that name operational within our Christian heritage. Again, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Now, I could, I could punctuate that and I'd say, keep them in your name. All right, so if I would say in your name, wouldn't I be saying in in your name, Yahweh. I would say something like that to that effect. Father, Holy Father, keep them knowing your name could be another translation. Keep them in your name or keep them knowing your name. So Jesus knew not only, proved that not only did he know the name of God, but he practiced telling his disciples that we should know the name of God and we should practice knowing the name of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. If that prayer was not so popular, I never would have gotten this off the ground with people. But the fact that the Our Father is so popular and people say it as part of convention and don't realize what they're praying when they're praying it and don't realize how powerful that prayer truly is. Now, I'm going to take you over to Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel 36, starting in verse... 21. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned amongst the nations where they went. How was the name profaned? Number one, it was covered up. Number two, it was, it was forgotten. And number three, maybe it was used in, in some sort of uh, a form of a curse. But the two first ones, are, number one, it was covered up. And number two, it was just simply forgotten. That's how you profane a name. That's how you profane God's name is by not mentioning it any longer. Now in verse 22, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God. Now, when we read in the beginning of my Bible how they use different convention in explaining Adonai and Lord, here it's reversed. Look in your Bibles. Now we see the word Lord, it's, it's upper and lower case, capital L, to let us know it's referring to the Godhead. But underneath that original Hebrew is Adonai. And then we see right next to it, G-O-D in capitalization. And that refers to then Yahweh, what you see in my pulpit here, yud heh vav -Hey, being written. So it's saying, well, well, in order, if we're reading it in English order, it's saying Adonai Yahweh, but it really, you kind of have to invert both of those for proper Hebrew. And it would mean or say Yahweh Lord, Yahweh Adonai. And we see G-O-D here is covering up the actual name. Now, if we put the, use the rest of the convention that's being used previously in your Bible and all the, a lot of the different books, if I kept, 
L-O-R-D capitalized, I would see Lord with upper and lower case and then Lord right next to it, Lord, Lord. And the only reason that they came up with the G-O-D is to keep the convention a secret from general people reading their Bibles. Because you would read that, uh, thus says the Lord, Lord. But it doesn't say, thus says the Lord, Lord. Thus says Yahweh Adonai, or Yahweh the Lord. Is it not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name? So he's saying who he is, and then he says he's going to act for his holy name, which you have profaned amongst the nations where you went. Let's keep reading. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. There we see it again. He's going to vindicate himself concerning his holy name. The original Hebrew behind everything here, every single time we see Lord or God in caps is Yahweh. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned amongst the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am Yahweh. Now we, we slip back. See this again? Now it slips back not to God, G-O-D in caps, but to L-O-R-D in caps. Do you know how difficult this was for 2,000 years to keep this a secret? Now some people knew about it. There were flare-ups throughout all the generations of the last 2,000 years in some smaller churches, but it never became popular. Everyone was afraid to attack the convention. And even today, even Messianic Jewish groups many times are afraid to touch this because they then would fall out with their group. Yet God is saying his name, not his title, not his association, but his name. Let's keep reading. Verse 23. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. If it's a great name, why can't we say it? Which has been profaned amongst the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, not the Lord, declares, now look at this, in the same sentence, declares, he goes from Lord, L-O-R-D caps, declares capital L-O-R-D, and then capital G-O-D. Do you see how difficult this had to be for the translators to keep this a secret? And they understood that since it was a convention or a ban by the Jews, that they were doing God a favor by keeping that ban alive. They didn't think that they were violating anything. They just were not understanding the scriptures and what they were reading. This is powerful. Let's keep going. Declares Yahweh Adonai. When I prove myself holy among you in their sight. When is this personal prophecy going to appear? This one prophecy is going to appear for certain on the last day of the seven year tribulation. When Jesus arrives with all of his armies, comes down and defeats uh, the Antichrist and, uh, and Megiddo and, and Har Megiddo and the, the, the valley of Jezreel is filled with blood to a horse's bridle. We're going to see that happening. He's going to vindicate himself. But how do we know he's going to be vindicating his great name if people haven't been warming up to it? And I believe we're in the end of the end of the age. We're going to see a cycle of churches just saying, we're going to start using this name. In fact, there's many Bibles out there beginning to use the name. The World English Bible is one of them. In fact, the World English Bible uses Yahweh, I think, some 6,400 times in the Old Testament. And many other Bibles are being translated properly, removing Hashem, removing Adonai, removing Lord, and putting in God's proper name. Either yud heh vav -Hey, at least the transliteration of the letters, or his full name, the transliteration of the pronunciation of those letters. Verse 24, for I will take you from among the nations and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Has that been happening? That's prophetically being fulfilled. We've been seeing that going on long before uh, Israel became a nation. In fact, we've been seeing it going on for the last, uh, you could say, roughly about 120 years. People coming back to Israel from different lands. And I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. All right, verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart 
and put a new spirit within you, and I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. All right, so he's saying here that it's because your heart is hard that you don't want to say his name. Now, if we, when we know that these things are going to occur, what else is going to occur? I'm going to close it here in the book of Revelation, right? Because I'm out of time here today. Let's go over to the book of Revelation right now. When I first taught on this in 2013, I preached on his name for 13 weeks straight. Because that's how much teaching it takes to get this into our spirit. When you have 7,000 times God's name coming up just in the Old Testament, including not only Yahweh, but Yah. And then we have it happening in the New Testament as well. And we have Hebrewisms in the New Testament. It takes a long time to teach that. All right, you can't go through 7,000 different scriptures in six months, but you can try. Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 5, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. All right? So we know that my name... And your name will be confessed before the Father and his angels. Jump down to verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God. Who's speaking here? If you have a red letter Bible, you can see that Jesus is speaking. And not only is Jesus prophetically speaking, but he's saying the name of my God or my Father. And, and he, all those are capitalized. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of heaven from my God and my new name. So there's going to be three names written on our foreheads. We're going to have the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the city, the new Jerusalem written on our foreheads. If we're going to have those names written, is it going to say G hyphen D so we don't offend anybody? Well, maybe there might be some Jewish Messianic people out there. We'll get them offended. No, God doesn't care about that. God wants, God is God. He's not going to pay attention to bands or convention in heaven. Now let's jump down to verse 21. He overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. All right. So he's again referring. We can see that Jesus is speaking through these three scriptures. This is no accident that he's saying that we're going to get three names written on our forehead. What are those names going to be? If I exist that I exist cannot change. We find out that in God there is no shadow of turning. Are you with me? If there's no shadow of turning, then his name doesn't change. Maybe our understanding of how to pronounce his name might change. But his name does not change. All right, now let's go over to uh, chapter uh, 14, Revelation chapter 14. And Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, in other words, in Jerusalem, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Here, Jesus is not speaking. All right, we can see that Jesus is not speaking. It's not in red letters. And what does it say again? Having his name, in other words, the name of Jesus, or Yeshua, and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Here we see it again a second time. You can't get away, get away from that. Now jump down with me to Revelation chapter 22. Okay. Revelation 22. And now starting in verse 12, again, it's in red letters in my Bible. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with you to render to every man according that what he has done. Now I'm going to stop here. What language presumably... Have I told you, and I've proved it with the Hebrewisms that are in here, what language is this being written in? I've proved to the majority of you in this congregation that this letter was written originally, not in Greek, not in Aramaic, 
It was written in Hebrew. The language of John, the language of Yeshua. Amen. Verse 13. I know some of you really like this part. And then he says, we're reading it in the English. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. But that's not really what's being said. The first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet is Alpha and Omega. The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph, and the last letter is Tav. And so if you're translating that from Hebrew into Greek, it loses its meaning. So if I take an Aleph and a Tav and I put them together, which appear, by the way, in the Old Testament some 13,000 times, and you know what? The majority of the 13,000 times, they are left untouched. If you have a Hebrew translation and, you, and it's word for word into English, you'll see that there's just a blank there. There's an Aleph and there's a Tav right next to one another as if it's a word and it's left untouched. And Jesus says here, not that I'm the Alpha and the Omega. He says, I'm the Aleph and the Tav. I'm the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I'm the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, number one. Number two, you know those, that two words, those two words that are under some sort of, of uh, a hidden meaning that remains unchallenged and uninterpreted in your Hebrew Bible? I am he represented in those two letters. I'm the Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the Tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Here, it's being translated into Greek. And then we read from Greek into English. So we, hear, we see Alpha and Omega, the first and the last of the Greek alphabet, but not the first and the last. And so we know that Jesus is the first, he's the last. All, all the hidden meanings begin to bubble up when you begin to read that. Amen. Praise God. And so that's the revelation that I want to give you here today. Let's all stand. Praise God. You get something out of that today? Amen. Amen. Give God the glory. Let's pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name once again uh, over your people here today, over all those that are watching live. And Father, we thank you for this teaching and this word, and we give you glory. Father, uh, cause us to be intellectually, not just spiritually, but intellectually, not just mechanically, but intellectually assent, Father God, to using your name whenever we can. In Jesus' name.